Hello and welcome to the Valley Today. I am your host, Janet Michael. It is Community Health Day. That is our day every month where we meet up with somebody from Valley Health. They, of course, are our community health partner. Today, we're going to bust a few myths about New Year resolutions when it comes to your diet and being healthy. So I've got some experts on the screen with me today. Tracy Mitchell is here with us. She is the Director of Wellness Services and Risk Reduction. Catherine Sellers is here with us as well. She is a clinical dietitian with Wellness services. Thank you both for taking some time this morning to give me the proper path to take if I want to be healthier in the new year. Happy New Year, Janet. We are really excited to be here today. Tracy, I want to start with you. Tell me a little bit about wellness services at Valley Health, because I'm not sure a lot of people understand and realize that is there, because so many of us tend to think of Valley Health as a place we go when we're sick. Sure. Valley Health has had a wellness services department for 30 plus years. So really, we are ahead of many others in devoting resources and staff and personnel to prevention and educating and working with folks to take better care of themselves and prevent illness and prevent disease. We work with our own over 6,000 employees here at Valley Health, and we also work with agencies and individuals out in the community trying to help them to be their best selves. Catherine, I would imagine so much of that does rely on what we eat, the food that we put into our bodies. I know exercise plays a role. Mental health obviously plays a very large role, but sometimes it really does start with our diet. Yep, absolutely. I think definitely nutrition is going to be the foundation for a lot of things. There's a lot of not so much misconceptions, but sometimes people will sometimes almost cut things out and we really miss out on that nutrition and miss out on a lot of great nourishment we can get from food and simple things we can find in our own grocery stores. I always joke with friends that while the new year starts off with a bang, we're all staying up late and we're enjoying time with friends, there's fireworks and things like that. New Year's Day sometimes is really daunting for people who have have said this year, my new year resolution is I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to eat better. I'm going to do all of these things. But I have learned from my conversations with many Valley Health employees over the years, being that generic and that general isn't necessarily the smart way to set those goals. And that's right. If you think about it, we don't wake up on January 1st, a totally different person. Certainly, we all reflect back on the previous year and want a fresh start. We're still the same person we were on December 31st. So we really discourage people from setting what we think of those traditional New Year's resolutions. We encourage people to set goals, but just not these sort of big sweeping changes that are likely unattainable. When you look at some of the research on New Year's resolutions, already after the first week in January, the number of people that are still doing whatever it is that they planned on doing has dropped down to about 70%. After about a month, it's dropped down to about 60%. And if you look at a six month window of time, then less than 50% of the people are still doing what they were starting to do on January 1st. Yeah, because it's not just important to identify what it is, what changes you want to make. You really have to have a plan. You can't just say it and put it out into the universe and assume that's just going to happen by some divine intervention. You really have to figure out, okay, if this is what I want to do, how am I going to get there and put those steps into place so that you can follow them and reach that goal? When we work with clients, we really talk to them about where they are on those levels or tiers of change, if you will. There really are some formal stages of change One is considered pre-contemplation. Somebody's just aware of an issue, a concern, a problem that they want to address. Then you can move into the contemplation stage where people are thinking a little bit about it. Preparation is the next step where, hey, I'm going to do something. And as you said, Janet, I'm going to put a plan together. The next phase is action, where the person is really involved in making the change. Maybe I'm walking three or four times a week, or I'm buying healthier food at the grocery store. So that's the action phase. And then with behavior change, we all have to think about maintenance. 
how are we going to keep this going? How are we going to sustain that change in the long run? Tracy, you've been on the show. Ben Daleski has been on the show with me, and we've talked about setting smart goals. And I really like how that is laid out because it really does describe what you've just talked about, and it gives us that smart to stick in our head to try and remember where we are or what we're supposed to be doing next. And the acronym really was coined back in the early 80s by a gentleman named George Doran. It stands for these things, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. So a great example would be instead of saying, I want to walk more as a goal, you would want to be very specific and say, I want to walk three times a week. We can measure that. We could track that on a calendar. We could get an app or a Fitbit or something like that. The attainable and the achievable part. Three days is probably reasonable. To think somebody's going to do that seven days a week, yeah, not that realistic. The relevant part, too, is, is this something I want to do or something somebody else is asking or nudging me to do? You want that goal to be relevant to your life and have something that's going to fit in with your lifestyle. And then we also want to tack or tie on some time sensitivity, some time boundaries to that, because we want to check in. I'm going to do this for four weeks or six weeks, and then look at my progress, look at where I was successful, what barriers did I run into, troubleshoot those barriers, and then see, is this something I'm going to move forward with? Maybe I'm going to keep walking three days a week. Maybe I'm going to add an extra day and make it a little more challenging. But that SMART acronym helps us to stay focused. It's great to gauge your progress too along the way. So maybe you set that goal that you're going to walk three days a week and realize that you really do enjoy it. So maybe instead of adding a fourth day because you're busy and you can't necessarily take that time, you're going to walk longer. You're going to go a mile and a half instead of a half of a mile. You're going to add to it. It really does give you actual information to use, not something that's just floating around in the air that you assume. Absolutely. I have even worked with people before where I'll say, give me five minutes, give me five minutes. And as you said, Janet, usually when somebody's done five minutes, they'll go another five minutes or 10 minutes or whatever it is. So yes, start small, set those small goals that build almost like stepping stones or a staircase. Those small goals build on one another to get to that long-term goal. Catherine, I can imagine a lot of people in the new year made the new year resolution that I'm going to eat better. I'm going to eat healthier, which is as generic a resolution (laughs) as anything that I have ever heard. That makes it really hard if you don't have one of these smart goals for your diet to be able to do that. Because what does that mean exactly? It's different for everybody. That's correct. And that's why it's really important to come up with a good plan and really determine what you want to do. And also to define what is healthy. That's where there's a lot of confusion. I think definitely in my field, there's a lot of, I always refer to it as noise, meaning there's so many competing interests, so many different sources of information out there. Some of it can really be opinion and in some cases can even be harmful. Others can be really helpful and can be something that, again, getting back to that nourishment, making sure you're getting what you need to support your health and support your body. So that's the important thing is really getting good information, fact-based information, things that are going to support you versus maybe be a little deflating or maybe even a little bit harmful. So important to know when you're coming up with those goals, what source are you using? What information are you using? And then asking a question, is this something that's really going to benefit me? Is this something that is going to be long-term? And is this realistic for me personally? And it's got to have some component of it that you enjoy, at least to a certain degree. You can't say, I'm going to cut out all junk food. You're not going to enjoy that. That's going to make you angry. It's going to make you want to cheat. It's going to defeat the whole purpose of what you're trying to do in the new year. So you've got to find ways, I would guess, to mix in things that you like when you're changing your diet and things along those lines. Yeah, that's absolutely accurate. And something that's really important is being realistic. Is it realistic to say you'll never do this again? It's that all or nothing thinking. And that's really where we run into trouble, especially when we have special events, whether it be your birthday, a holiday. Those are sometimes things that we do enjoy and you do want to be able to incorporate and you want to be able to look at it 
reasonably where it's not so much achieved. It's just, I had a piece of cake on my birthday. Is it really bad? Is it really off the edge? Sometimes when we look at food, we look at that good or bad, and it really is just objectively, it's food. It's something we ate for enjoyment. It's something we ate for pleasure, maybe even part of a celebration. And if you're taking care of yourself on the other end of that, meaning you're getting your food groups in, you're keeping yourself well-nourished, you definitely have room for that on occasion. It just becomes that question of how much, how often, and how can you work it in a realistic and reasonable way? And you touched on this a second ago because we see so much on television in particular about all of these different types of diets. There's the keto diet and there's the this diet and there's the that diet. Each of us are different. You just as well put a bullet in my head then tell me I can't have pasta or bread because that is just never going to work for me. That is not a diet that would ever work for me. But it's hard because I think so many people think I'm going to do this diet and it's going to get me to where I need to go. And that's not always the case either. Especially like you just touched on it. There are certain things that you want to be able to incorporate them. It might be a big staple. And also to some of those items, especially right now, they're pretty affordable, right? Like pasta is something that's affordable. Rice is affordable. Those foods are going to be staples. And some of them can have some healthy nutrients in them as well. And that's something you definitely want to be paying attention to when you are embarking on a plan is, is this realistic long-term and really questioning the source, questioning the evidence and not in a negative way, of course, but just looking at all the research, where did it come from? How long has it been studied? And then asking, is this really necessary or are there other alternatives or other sides of it? Getting to the pasta, that's something that could be bringing in, especially if you're using whole wheat pasta, you're going to be getting some fiber with that. That could be supportive of health. You're going to be getting other sets of nutrients. It might be coming to that question of how much can this be built in in a portion controlled or healthy way? And the answer is for most people, absolutely yes, unless you have an allergy to the item. In many cases, you're going to be able to incorporate that into a plan overall to, to support your health. And again, being realistic with it, something you can do long term. And these don't always have to be when we're talking about our dietary changes, they don't have to happen on January one either I can say, at the end of the year, this is where I want to be. And along the way do things like swap out my pasta for something that is more wheat based where I can go to a vegetable only version of something else, just having that education and knowledge and being able to add those in as I go sometimes is a whole lot more successful for some of us than it is for others. Yeah, absolutely. And again, some of us, that's the thing. It's something where you really want to know yourself and know how well you do. I can tell you after working with clients for many years, I've met all sorts of different people, all different motivation styles. Some people really do better with the step approach, meaning they take inventory of what they're doing. They see what does their life look like right now. And if they're trying to work on a goal, say they're trying to cut out soda, for example, if they're usually doing four 20 ounce sodas a day, they might start by cutting it down to three and then going to two and going to one. And that approach works better for them. But where sometimes when I'm working with people, they might be fine waking up the next day. It's just really knowing yourself well enough to get organized in a way that's beneficial for you and then making those changes on that level. And again, being able to identify with it, what works well for you works well for you. What works well for somebody else works well for somebody else. So we really want to be able to be upfront with yourself with that, have that good conversation, honest conversation, figure out, know yourself well enough to set your goals. One thing that can help you as you move through this journey that I think is really important. One, we start with all our clients from a strength-based approach to really say, what are your own internal resources and skill set and your knowledge and what things do you have that will help this action plan carry through? the rest of 2023. But the other thing is social support. If I'm trying to change the way I eat, it's important that my family be a part of that conversation and that equation, because likely we're all perhaps cooking together, sitting down at the table together. If I'm trying to start an exercise program, it's great if I have a buddy to walk with or meet me at the gym, because that supports that change. So looking at social support can be a key ingredient there. No pun intended with ingredient. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a break. When we come back, I want to talk about that a little bit more about putting together that personal plan, because it really does have to be personalized. Catherine, you touched on this as well. Just because something is working for my best friend or my husband doesn't necessarily mean that it works for me. And putting together my own plan is very important. Can we talk about that in the next segment? 
Absolutely. We are on the screen today with Tracy Mitchell. She is the Director of Wellness Services and Risk Reduction at Valley Health. Catherine Sellers is here as well. She is a clinical dietitian with Wellness Services. We're getting you healthy without a resolution, just a goal, a smart goal. We're going to do more of that when we come back in just a couple of minutes. Hello, I'm Brenna Jollermine, a graduating senior at Mountain Vista Governor School, and we're partnering with local environmental nonprofit Sustainability Matters to help you help yourself while helping the planet. Did you know that according to Columbia Climate School, in 2017, only 34% of municipal solid waste was recycled? In fact, recycling companies cannot reuse plastic if it is contaminated with other materials, meaning only a sixth of the plastic you recycle is reused and the rest is incinerated. Also, did you know that not all plastic is easily recycled? Choose containers with the numbers 1 and 2 in the recycle symbol. These are the most widely recyclable. Better yet, upcycle as much as you can. My favorite is to turn plastic jugs into seedling pots for native plants. Thank you for listening. This has been an ecologically exciting message from the Mountain Vista Governor School and Sustainability Matters, reminding you that together we can keep the river clean and the valley green. Welcome back to the Valley today. I am your host, Janet Michael. It is Community Health Day. We are on the screen with Tracy Mitchell. She is Director of Wellness Services and Risk Reduction at Valley Health. Catherine Sellers is with her as well. She is a clinical dietitian with Wellness Services. We're talking about being healthier in 2023 and not just saying that but putting together, Tracy, a plan to actually make that happen so that when you're at the end of 2023 and you're looking back, you're like, wow, I feel better. I'm walking more. I'm doing all of these things and can check them off and feel like a better person at the end of the year. And we want that plan to be fun, right? You talked earlier about choosing things that you like and not setting yourself up for failure by forcing yourself to eat a particular vegetable, let's say, that you've hated since you were a child or take up a particular type of exercise that you really just do not like. We want to make the healthy choice the easy choice, but we want you to have fun along the way. This shouldn't be miserable. It should be enjoyable and bringing health and wellness to your life should bring you joy. I think that's where you guys are incredibly valuable because a lot of us on the outside, I say in air quotes, we don't really know what all of our options are. Because this is one of those things that people think they know and they don't know what they don't know. Having you to say, here's a whole bunch of other options and here are other things you can do is incredibly valuable. And that's where a health coach on our team comes in. That's where Catherine, as our registered dietitian, comes in. We are in a supportive role to try to get those resources, those ideas to work collaboratively with a customer or a client to come up with solutions. Catherine, in the last segment, you mentioned taking inventory. I have always heard that the first thing that you should consider doing when you're going to make a dietary change is start logging your food, which to me is terrifying because I probably eat a lot worse than I think I do. And then when I see it on paper, I'm going to think, wow, I am in really bad shape. Why is that important? It is important just to establish really what's going on with you right now. Sometimes we think about maybe what was going on when we're engaging our diet plans, what our life was like 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And then when we're trying to get started now, we might try and lean on that plan that worked for us at that time. But now we're in the future, now we're in the now. So taking that inventory is extremely important. As you just mentioned, it can be hard to get into it. Sometimes you don't want to look at it or there may have been a bad experience in the past. I definitely recommend it. Again, get your baseline, figure out what's going on, because that's going to be a way to drive your plan and even set those goals. It helps you identify those trends. And also to look at it in a very neutral way. Sometimes we can be our own worst critic when it comes to things. So it will be looking at it, more investigation. What is going on right now? What do I want to keep in my meal plan? What do I maybe want to change? You can use your personal data to compare it to a lot of the information that's out there that is going to be a benefit to you, but it's getting started, looking at what's here and now, what's there, 
what goals do I want to set around my personal intake, my personal lifestyle right now? I can tell you it is also really hard to keep up with food blogging, food journaling, not just the kind of the stress of maybe getting started or feeling like maybe there's going to be some judgment, which if you're working with me, there won't be, but thinking there might be some judgment, but it can be tedious and it can be hard to keep up with. I usually will set a goal for people where I say, hey, just try and do it for at least one week. You can get a lot of good information from that, maybe some structured work days and days where maybe you're not working and things are a little bit looser. Sometimes when I'm working with clients, they might make it halfway there, three or four days. But even within that three or four days, they get so much information and we can really set some goals just by looking into what's going on. Something might be isolated, something might click and we can say, hey, this might be an area to adjust overall to get you started. We hear a lot about, and we touched on diets in the first segment as well, but so much of this goes back to your lifestyle. We got... And I'm sure my listeners are sick to death of hearing me talk about these dogs, but we we got dogs during the pandemic. And it wasn't until a couple of months ago that I realized how different my life is from a structural perspective because of these dogs. It's not just that I have to not be gone too long because they need to go out, but there are certain habits that I didn't know I had that the dogs have made me realize, like they realize when I'm done with a Zoom, I apparently say the same thing when I'm wrapping up a Zoom and they come off wherever they are in the house and they're here and they're ready to go out. And when they're ready to go out, I go to the coffee pot. There are these little things that you may not even realize that you're doing because they have become that habit that I would think writing them down and then looking at them with someone who is objective like you would make it easy to go, oh, well, that's an easy thing to fix. I'll just change this one thing. Sometimes it's not as daunting as a lot of people feel like it might be. And sometimes when you're working to change a habit, one sort of trick of the trade, and I can tell one on myself, is to substitute a different behavior in the place of the one that you're trying to change. For example, we'll stick with eating. I found myself, as soon as I would come through the door, right into the kitchen, grab the bag of chips. As you're saying, Janet, creature of habit, right? Come home from work, in the kitchen, bag of chips. And so I thought, this is something that I really want to try to change. I want to try to change this habit that I've gotten into. What I decided to do then is when I come in the door, instead of going directly into the kitchen, I'm going to go into the bathroom and brush my teeth. Or I'm going to keep sneakers right by the front door. And rather than going into the kitchen and grabbing those chips, I'm going to go ahead and put my sneakers on. So I start with my walk. So I'm trying to interfere or interrupt that pattern that I've created over many months and substitute something different to take its place. Since we're telling our secrets, here's one of the one of the issues. No, it's no secret, Janet. Everyone knows Tracy loves potato chips. No secret. One of the things that I struggle with is that I don't eat breakfast. I used to years ago when I had to get up and leave the house at eight o'clock and I had kids and all of that sort of thing, but I find it incredibly difficult to eat anything before lunch. And sometimes I don't eat all day until it's dinner time and I can't figure out how to make myself eat. (laughs) Is that a big problem? It usually is a good idea to get something in there really to break that fast, just to make sure, again, you're getting that opportunity to get your nutrition in. Sometimes when we think about diet, we think about restriction, taking things away, but also equally important is making sure that we are getting in adequate amounts of our food groups for the vitamins and minerals they contain. Something that can be a challenge, as you just mentioned, is getting in in breakfast. So again, looking at your entire day, like what does the rest of the day look like? Is something where the portions in the evening might be larger so that when you're waking up, I'm not saying this is the case right now, but that when you're waking up, you may not necessarily feel as hungry. Sometimes that might be an area for adjustment. Another thing to look at might be what are we thinking of as breakfast? Is it a traditional breakfast meal where it involves a lot of cooking, a lot of prep? Sometimes the thought of that can also be a bit daunting. Is there something small you might be able to put in really to get that day started? So it might be something like a piece of fruit and yogurt. Those are two food groups. One of them is going to give you a little bit of calcium. The fruit's going to give you a little bit of fiber, a little bit of vitamins and minerals, but it's really two items just to lay that foundation. And that's something that's buildable as well. Once you get that in there, once you get that routine in there, it starts to become a little bit easier. And again, it's something that you would be starting small, tracking your progress and saying, Hey, 
three days out of seven, I, I did breakfast. And then next week, maybe we can work on it a little bit more if that's goal that's important to you. But again, it's looking at that. What else is going on? What does the rest of the day look like? And also too, what are we considering breakfast? Is there any barriers to it? And if so, how can we work on those barriers? In what types of situations should I or could I reach out to you, Tracy, and your team at Wellness Services? Catherine really has two services that she offers. One of those is called medical nutrition therapy, and that does require a referral from a physician and is typically reserved for people that would have rather complex medical conditions. And then she also offers wellness nutrition coaching, which is self-referred. That might be for somebody that's just trying to do a little better of a job feeding their family. It could be somebody that maybe has decided in the new year they'd like to become a vegetarian. It could be somebody trying to lose weight. So two options that people have if they want to meet with Catherine, and she can talk a little bit about some of those services as well. As Tracy was mentioning, we got two different kind of tracks if you want to look at it that way. Medical nutrition therapy, when we're thinking about that, again, that's usually going to be coming from a doctor, the referral from the doctor's office, maybe nurse practitioner, or even physician's assistant. And generally, that's going to be geared towards a defined condition, meaning if somebody's trying to manage IBS or if they're trying to manage cholesterol concerns, those types of things, we would be getting that referral. And that's something we would reach out after we receive the referral to get people on the schedule. And then we have the self-refer option. And that includes so many things. A lot of it I would consider almost preventative as well. If you're trying to stay ahead of any chronic health conditions or trying to manage things, say there's a strong family history. And what those would look like too is really just both options. It's going to be a one-on-one appointment. We're really doing a deep dive, looking into history in terms of nutrition and also too just looking at the here and now, as I was mentioning earlier, what does your job look like? What does your family situation look like? Because all of those things can really impact the goals we set, what we're working on and what our plan is going to be going forward. That self-refer portion of the program, the nutrition wellness coaching, my husband's work, the health insurance offers a wellness program. And if we participate in things like that, like we come to you and say, hey, this is what we want to do. And we can show them, hey, this is what we're doing. They give us a discount on his health insurance. So looking for the extra options, the silver linings to being able to do this sometimes is really great to to do as well. And it's not uncommon, Janet, that a, a company, a corporation will reach out to us and they'll want a package of nutrition coaching for their employees. They're that vested and invested in the health and wellness of their workforce that they're willing to say, hey, we'll purchase a package of nutrition coaching And let's get our folks healthy and well and thinking about changes in their lifestyle. I love that I have the option of reaching out to you myself. In addition to having a medical reason, I can reach out to you and say, hey, look, help me get started. Because sometimes that's really all that you need to do, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. I say reaching out, just saying, these are my goals. What can we do to help? I think that's a great approach. Sometimes it's hard to reach out, but it's definitely something that can be beneficial. We might notice something. Sometimes people outside can notice, hey, this is going on. I saw this in your log or I saw this. Is there anything you want to set around it in terms of goals? Or what do you think about this? Just to get that conversation started it might bring a new perspective in because usually when I'm working with people, they're coming in with a lot of information. A lot of it's going to be good information. They know themselves best. And I definitely recognize that when I'm working with somebody, definitely I would recommend asking, reaching out to add to what you know, not so much to replace everything, but add to what you know, bring a different set of eyes, different perspective, just to really help you get where you want to go long-term. I will put links to the outpatient nutrition services at Valley Health. I'll share my cheat sheet in the show notes page of the podcast so people can go click through and see what different options are available out there because there are a ton of resources available on the internet. And like you mentioned earlier, Catherine, they are credible resources. They're government agencies, they're organizations like the American Heart Association and the American Diabetes, things you can trust when you're reading what they're suggesting that you do or learning about this path as you move along it. Great resources. And another thing about those is there are things that you can look at without having to sign up or pay for anything. And very straightforward. And you can use them again on that personal level, just finding what appeals to you, clicking around, looking around. And a lot of them are going to cover a broad range. They're going to cover nutrition, but also too, they talk about other areas of health and lifestyle to help manage health. So that's going to be fitness, other things that are going to be brought in there. So great resources for sure. The American Heart Association, for example, on that website, there are free recipes 
fees and they are so user friendly. They are step by step. They tell you what the yield is. You don't have to sign up for anything. So I definitely recommend poking around on that website for sure. Thank you both for taking some time today. This has been really interesting. And I'm thinking a lot of people are listening, thinking, okay, I've been beating myself up over this. And now I need to cut myself a break and take a new approach. Yep. I would say, and just in summing up, new year, new you, remember incremental changes. Remember that buddy or support system. And above all else, have fun and enjoy the journey. Tracy, Catherine, thank you so much for your time today. Thank Thank you. you. I will be back tomorrow. I will have a brand new episode of The Valley today ready to go for you a few minutes after noon. So meet me here then.